Yeah, so anyway, uh, let's pray. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for your blessings. Uh, thank you for springtime. Uh, I know a lot of us are getting excited to get outside and feel the warmth. Um, me, you know, I like it cold, but but I'll take it for the team. But seriously, God, we just we just thank you. We thank you for all that you do. And Lord, it's just the change of seasons, God. It's awesome. It's awesome to see uh, see what you do. Bringing life out of what appears to be nothing with flowers out of the ground. So it's a, a very cool thing. Um, and as we break today, maybe we'll do small groups and stuff and pray for uh, Mr. Sam's dad, who happens to be Sam as well. So we just lift up Sam and uh, we just ask that you'll heal his body. Uh, thank you, God, that he's still with us and, and um, you know, according to Sam, is ready to get up and, and uh, leave. So um, he still has got his spirit. So we just ask for uh, strength there. and. Pray for the family that they'll be able to um, just be uh, just be a comfort to him. We ask now that, uh, that when we're getting ready to to go through your word and aim to Father that uh, something uh, may spark uh, thought in each of these fellows that uh, that it'll be something that they can take home with them. And Lord, uh, get me out of the way. Um, as I've said multiple times in front of these guys, this is not necessarily my forte, but I'm still thankful for the opportunity. So. Your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> okay, so tonight it's uh, Nahum um, chapter 2. And a little bit of an opening here. I know Joel opened last week um, with this book. But 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count uh, slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, God through Jonah, um, we did the book of Jonah last. Uh, if you recall, um, Jonah really didn't want to go. God sent a big fish, and ultimately, um, Jonah went and uh, shared God's willingness of uh, granting mercy and lending mercy uh, through repentance. And um, and they accept it. So some odd hundred years later, we see now Nahum. Um, and here we represent and speak for God, but not kindness this time. It's judgment and wrath. Um, so like the word says, he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that we should perish. But he's also a just God. And, you know, we, at the end of the day, he's, he's got to judge sin. <clears throat> There is a, one verse in here that we'll see that's talking about restoration, but it's only restoration for Israel. There's nothing given like that for, uh, for the people of Nineveh. Um, the time has come for them to be judged. And so Nineveh, ultimately, we'll see, will uh, we'll be judged by God, and it's the justice uh, of God, in part for his people, but then for Nineveh itself and, and their wickedness. So in chapters 2 and 3, we will see in detail uh, what is to come upon the city of Nineveh. Um, this is a prophecy um, by Nahum, and sharing, sharing with uh, the Ninevites uh, what's coming. So verse 1, it says, He who scatters has come upon your face, or come before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. So uh, Assyria, if you've done any studying on them, um, they're brutal. Um, didn't take didn't take prisoners. Um, they just conquered and dispersed conquering nations and pretty much laid waste to everything in their path. Um, and so now we're seeing what's prophesied is is basically a, a similar judgment is upon them. They're going to get destroyed and they're going to get dispersed as well. In reading this, this isn't a biblical saying, but I'm reminded of the old saying, you know, what goes around comes around. So they did a lot of things for a lot of times, and they're going to basically get back, um, in some degree, exactly what they what they did. And then, to put it more biblically, Matthew 7, 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with, measure, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So Nahum here is telling them, Prepare for a coming invasion 
and ultimately we know it's going to come from Babylon. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately God is the one um, who rules and judges, but he's going to use kings, he's going to use governments, and they're going to be his instruments of judgment. Daniel 5.21 says that he was, this is, and what's interesting here is is this is uh, related to Nebuchadnezzar, and we'll find out that the people that are taking over who are taking over the Ninevites happens to be Nebuchadnezzar's dad. But in Daniel 5.21, it says, Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like beasts. His dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with wild grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of the heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Key word there is the Most High God rules among men, and he appoints who he chooses. So, you know, we may think we elected a given president. We might have been used to cast, you know, a ballot or moved by God to do whatever, but God knew who would be president you know, years and years ago. Um, we just got to see it now. <clears throat> Nahum 2, 2. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob, like the excellence of Israel, for the emptier have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. This is not necessarily a reference to a northern and southern tribe thing. Uh, the Assyrians, uh, sometime before, like 100 years before, had already uh, destroyed and, and taking care of the northern tribe of Israel, again, is part of judgment. Um, and we've seen it right over and over with Israel. You know, they do good, they're blessed, they get to do this, and then they, it's one thing after another with these guys, and similar with us, right? We get opportunities, we're doing the right thing, God blesses them, we decide to walk away, and God may have to corral us a little bit and get us back in line. He's doing the exact same thing with us that he's doing with Israel here. In Isaiah 4, 2, it says, In the day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of earth shall be excellent and appealing and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. This verse, and frankly, this, the second verse in Nahum here, speaks to Israel's restoration uh, in, their, uh, in their promised position. Um, we know that Jacob... Um, here is mentioned, and it would be their natural, um, the natural name for the Jews, um, pulled from their forefather Jacob. And then Israel here is mentioned as their spiritual name given by God. Um, and so the afflicted Jacob would be restored as Israel, though at a later date and time, when Israel's eyes are opened to Jesus as Messiah. <coughs> The excellence of Jacob and Israel here is the noting of a title of honor. Um, they're special in, in God's eyes. Um, and all of this refers back to um, Genesis 32, or kind of speaks to Genesis 32, 22 through 28, um, and God blessing Jacob at Peniel um, when he was given the name Israel. Verse 27 says, So he said to him, what is your name? The name is Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. So it's just more spotlight on the fact that, that Israel has been set apart. The verse talks about emptiers here. Um, Assyria repeatedly devastated lands, destroying vineyards, economic livelihood, because they would go in and conquer, just destroy everything, leave nothing, um, and communities to a large degree, couldn't support themselves. The same thing would happen with Israel here, and when Babylon came in later, the same exact thing. Um, they were, um, because they had rejected God time and time again, um, they would be, they would pretty much be emptied of themselves as well. So in part, um, the chastisement uh, of God, um, 
in this instance and in other instances, and frankly for our benefit too, um, would bring us to different places where we would actually say, all right, Lord, I, I see you, I get you, I hear you. Um, when everything's going just astoundingly great, we may just cruise along thinking we've got it under control, self-made man kind of thing, um, which is not a, it's not a happening comment. It's, it's not, a, not true. So God, right, um, it's all the um, cruelty of the Assyrians, not just on his chosen people, um, but again, just, you know, all the communities uh, surrounding, because they were, at the time, they were the power. Um, so God's now with them, you know, having God's Ishtar and just being cruel to people and, and everything, it's time for them to be judged. And it says in Isaiah 10, 5 and 6, it says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So that's just, that's what's coming for them. Nahum 2, 3. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. So we talk here about the shields being red. There's different things of why they're red. Um, one is they're, they're, they're dyed red, um, and what they're dyed in, if an arrow hits them and it's uh, on fire, it will help put it out. Uh, another one is um, if it's red and you get stabbed and you're bleeding, it's not going to get on your shield or be seen on your shield, so nobody's necessarily going to know that you're injured. Um, that might be good when you're up against somebody in a sword fight. The other take on this about it being red, um, a lot of stuff was made of copper or covered in copper. So you can imagine that you're fighting with your, with your shield, sun hits it, it gives a it can give off the appearance of, of red. So that, that too is, is another thought of, of this. Um, we talk some Medo Babylonian army. Um, their men are mighty. Their top color too was scarlet. Um, so again, same thing with the shield being red. If you're in scarlet, you take a you take a knife or an arrow or something and you start to bleed. It may not show up as much. It, it may be uh, a good way to help conceal your injury. And then it talks here too of uh, spears being brandished. Um, as you can imagine, you know, to see movies and stuff where people are waving their shields, waving their swords, um, just basically trying to, to demonstrate we're coming and we're going to kick your tail. So, so we've got all these armaments. And showing to their eager, right, and they're ready for, for battle. There's another another translation talks about a fir tree uh, being terribly uh, terribly shaken, and you know, as I was reading, they were talking about uh, you know your your weapons, their you know, your darts, your arrows, your javelins, just flying all over the place, um, and that kind of being a representation of the fir trees being shaken because they're being used as as uh, military elements. Regardless of, of interpretation here, um, we know that the ba any battle right, is a mental exercise. So what we see here, if nothing else, it is an attempt by parties to, to win the mental aspect of the battle. Nahum 2, verse 4. Chariots rage in the street. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. And just, just so clear, in studying this stuff, man, um, I've not really had to study for like a prophetic chapter or whatever. So I'm looking all over the place for what these things actually, you know, what everything actually means. And I and mean, I guess this is true of a lot of things, but, but in this, I found that there were 45 interpretations 
And of the 45 interpretations, two main ones would come out. Um, and so I wasn't necessarily struck thinking, as I was reading, I know that this is what's saying, first of all, I don't know who the heck am I that I would say that, because some of the things that I read were people <laughs> smart, brighter than me. All that to say, um, you know, as you're reading, as you're studying, as you're going to grab information, you know, consider your source, number one, because if you're going some oddball place, you're going to probably get oddball stuff. And then um, just be cautious with what you what you think. And, you know, if God's going to let you have a dogmatic um, interpretation, that's great. I didn't get this. So um, go study the scriptures, I guess, is what I'm saying. So, um, so in this, this verse, there, there was... Discussions on is it the preparation for battle or is it the battle itself that's being represented here? Um, and, and regardless of, of which side of the aisle you fall on there, if you see chariots raging in the street, um, they're running around like lightning, there's chaos, right? Um, either chaos in getting ready for battle or there's chaos because the battle was, was going on and there were so many chairs that were crashing all over the place. Um, if this verse is specifically about the preparation, then again, I think it's clear that preparation is not going so well. It's utter confusion. And then getting to the, the, the lightning and the torches, uh, again, we have um, chariots of metal, we've got weapons that are made of metal, and if the sun hits it, it's going to shine, and you know that may be the lightning that they're talking about as these things are moving around really, really fast to get into the places they need to be. Um, and then we'd be going fast if it's chariot battles. I don't know if you guys have ever watched, you know, old movies, but they have chariot battles, and one of the things they have on on the wheels are basically sickles that are basically these swords hanging out. And so you're having to jostle each other because you're trying to take out the other guy's wheels because if the wheels of the chariot go, you're done. Um, and if you're going you know, 30 miles an hour and your wheels go and you get flipped out, you're probably done yourself as well. Um, so some of the jostling here they're saying could be right the, the actual battles of the, um, of the chariots themselves. And then when it talks about tor torches, um, you know, <laughs> they are... What do you want to do when you beat another community? You want to set it ablaze. So you're going to carry torches with you and you're just going to heave them into things and catch things on fire. Um, that might be a representation here of the torches. And I just started thinking, so remember when I was talking about interpretation and being careful? So one of the things that a couple commentaries were trying to say is this was predicting and talking about automobiles. And I don't get that at all. Um, so I didn't follow that path because I don't think you see automobiles here. So again, just be as an example of, of being cautious. Verse 5. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to our walls. And the defense is prepared. So um, this is, again, I think talking about preparation, which is why I think this verse might be talking about preparation. First, when we're talking about preparation. Um, this is then of his king saying, Who can I depend on to fight? Which soldier soldiers have the best rep, rep, reputation so I can get them in place? Um, because he needs his best soldiers at the wall to defend the city. So he's looking around trying to figure out who he can call on. So, and then, and then um, when they talk about stumbling in their walk here, I kind of have the idea that. Um, that these guys are, are walking around dazed and confused and, and helpless because they thought they were safe. And now they're looking out. Once people started entering their city, who knew, right? I mean, they, they thought they were impenetrable. So they're the Assyrians. Nothing's going to happen to them. So um, I would imagine that I would be walking around dazed and confused if I, you know, I thought it was, I had it made, and now I realize it's not what I thought. So we have men of those military that are rushing uh, to the walls, um, trying to hit their towers. And there was a Greek historian, D. 
Dia Doris in the number of the towers at, at 1,500 and they reached 200 feet. So again, back in those times and even 1700s and 1600s and 1300s, if you had a castle, you had towers, you could, you could defend yourself. You could sit up there with arrows and do all kinds of things and if your wall was thick enough, nobody could come in. So again, they're thinking they're good, but, but they're not because they had built this, this, what they thought was an impregnable city. And as they're finding out, that's not the case. Um, and then the last thing we, we kind of see in this verse, um, Nahum to me a couple times when he's talking, I get the sense that he's almost having a ha-ha moment um, because he's saying, you know, he's saying, you know, get your nobles, you know, call the people, all this other kind of stuff. And we know what the outcome is, and I know he knows what the outcome is because God's given him the prophecy to 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 speak about. So he knows it's all over, and I think he's having a little fun uh, with with the Ninevites. Verse six: The gates of the rivers were opened, and the palaces dissolved. So this verse is starting to speak to how um, the Babylon Medo Babylonians are, are going to get in. Um, how they're going to destroy the city. So Nineveh, if you look on a map, and I actually, next week, uh, I had some pictures and some maps and stuff, and when I got there, I realized that I forgot it. But if you look, they're, they're flanked by the Tigris, or war, and then they have smaller rivers all around, so they've got water uh, all around them. And then one of the walls actually, for about two and a half miles, stretched along the Tigris, and it was only about 20 to 12 to 30 feet Above water line, so it wouldn't take much, either you know God doing it through rain or the Babylonians going in and saying, you know what, let's dam this up and dam that up, and as they do that, that'll 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 flood out the walls, um, and even the um, uh, Ninevites they had built dams because they knew that there was flooding that could occur. And so they would build dams to try to make the water go different places or stay back because they didn't want their, they could have done it to their own walls. So we know that the initial breach was caused by a flooding and that would cause the wall to, to crumble. And then the Babylonians would come through in the places where it broke through. And then again, this is that who knew moment. We thought this wall would stay forever. No, nope, sorry, not, not gonna happen. And then as they got in, you know, if you read stories of this, um, they had irrigation ditches for their farms and things like that, and the Babylonians probably went in and, and, and opened those up as well. Um, when it says gates of rivers were open, and opened those up as well, and then that would have flooded the city and also the palace, because we read later, or right here, it says the palace is dissolved. Um, water dissolves things. I mean, look at the Grand Canyon, right, from the flood. Um, a lot of people say millions of years, and nah, -uh, you get that much water going that fast for a small period of time, and it'll carve out. So, I mean, it can it could have taken out the, the palace pretty quick. Um, so, one of the things that's kind of interesting, and not just here, but just in general, um, we have people saying, oh, that, you know, people in the world saying this didn't happen, that didn't happen. Um, I know for a while they didn't even know that a Pontius Pilate other than the Bible existed and then they started finding things with Pilate's name on it and they're like, oh, I guess there was. Well, this is kind of the, the same thing. One, they had kind of lost it for, for a while. It was just it was covered. But now uh, they had ex excavated it and they're seeing flood debris. So we have an account. It's getting flooded and now archaeology is saying it did get flooded. Um, and it's pretty cool because we know we can trust the Bible, but it's nice when we can say we can trust the Bible and go, oh, by the way, you see this? That points to this being true. How are you going to argue it? Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so again, we have the Babylonians and the Medes coming through. The king had, had gone to his palace. He had taken his wealth. He had taken his ladies. And um, this is where he died. There's a, an interesting historical account recorded by, again, this Greek historian, Diodorus, on how the city fell, and this is what he said. There was an old prophecy that Nineveh should not be taken until the river became an enemy with the city. And in the third year of the siege, 
The river being swollen with continual rains overflowed every part of the city and broke down the wall of twenty furlongs. Then the king, thinking that the oracle was fulfilled and the river became an enemy of the city, built a large funeral pile in the palace, collected together all of his wealth, his concubines, his eunuchs, and he burned himself in the palace with them. And the enemy entered at the breach that the waters had made and took the city. So we have a, you know, kind of a, a, another account, if you will, uh, you know, of, of the situation that biblically was being talked about as well. Verse 7. It is decreed, she shall be led away captive, she shall be brought up, and her maid servants shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breasts. <clears throat> so this is another verse, and I'm looking at Steve here, I should have called Steve and let <laughs> him set me right, but this is another verse that, that there are a couple different ways you can, can look at this. Um, and we'll get into that here in a second, but but the first thing that jumps out at me is said, you know, the, the first line of the verse said, it is decreed, um, pretty much an absolute, right? It's decreed. This is what's going to happen. It's not maybe this, maybe that. If the sky does this, if the, if the earth does that, it's like, it's decreed. This is going to happen. And that's exactly what, what happened. So the she here, um, again, has, has, and this is where the, the interpretation thing comes into play. Um, one of the versions of, of the Bible, I can't remember which one it was, Jesus Huzab shall be led away. Um, and then it, it's probably not the name of a person, but instead speaking to the city of Nineveh itself and the people of Nineveh. Um, so refer to the inhabitants, inhabitants of Nineveh. And it would make some sense because as the Babylonians came in, everybody was running away, we'll see later, and every, everything got scattered. And as this was occurring, obviously, you know, if, if our city here, right, Kernersville burnt down, I think we'd all be pretty sad. Loss of life, loss of friends, loss of whatever. Um, we'd probably be um, torn up about it as well, maybe beating our breasts as well for, for what happened. So that would make some sense. Um, there's another interpretation that talks about it being the queen. Um, the arguments against that are the queens of this time in society were not overly valued, um, and the goddess, uh, and in this instance would have been Ishtar, would have been more revered, more important than even uh, the queen. And so there was, you know, conjecture obviously there thinking that we're talking about the goddess being taken away here. And, you know, the argument for that would be that often when a city would get taken, the the gods, the implements, um, all of that would be a spoil, right? I mean, we know that, you know, Babylon, when they did their thing, they took, you know, all the wealth and, of the temple and everything, they took it, took it with them. This is kind of a, a similar thing. And that would lead um, people to think that it is um, the goddess of, of Assyria. And she shall be led away, the goddess of, of uh, Nineveh, um, be taken by the attackers in, in, in part to show my God's better than your God. See, she's being led in chains. Um, and then we have the, the, the prostitutes, the handmaidens, um, all mourning uh, the, the fate of, of their city and their God. And then obviously, again, I kind of mentioned they'd be greeting their breast, right, out of, out of sadness uh, for their city, for their goddess, and it refers to doves here um, taking flight in the way, um, and we have probably have some hunters in here that hunt dove. I've seen dove fly away a couple times, but it's been a long time, but I do know they make, they make a different sound than other birds do, and I think, um, we're, we're trying, I think he was trying to give us a, a kind of a, a mental picture, or in this instance, they would know what doves sound like, we might even know what doves sound like, and this is, this is kind of trying to give us a, you're here, seeing this, hearing this yourself when it's, when it's occurring. Verse 8, 
Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. So Nineveh had been an oasis in the desert and attracted a lot of people. People visited the city for trade, for commerce, for entertainment. Um, now because of God's judgment of the city, it's no, no longer going to be a, a place of, of gathering. So I think people are seeing the destruction, and while we see halt, halt here, which which uh, can be interpreted as a stand, you know, don't move, stand. Um, people aren't listening, and they're out of there. Um, so uh, you know, nobody's heeding, nobody's heeding their pleas, and Nineveh's you know going to be no more. Verse nine: Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure. Or wealth of every desirable prize. So Nineveh was a city of, of great wealth, had great riches, um, ill-gotten gain, but still um, they had they had lots of, of things. Um, and now it's going to be her turn to be plundered. And so we're seeing here, you know, him saying, "Take the silver, take the gold, um, everything you want here. Go grab it." Um, and so looting is, is basically in full force. And so once loot herself, then it was now, um, her pockets are going to be picked, picked clean as well um, and be looted until nothing's left. And nothing would be left but a mound of ruins uh, for a long time. Um, verse 10, she is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts, the knees shake, much pain is in every side, and all their faces are drained of color. So I think it's pretty clear that we're emphatically saying Nineveh is not going to be here anymore, period. She's, she's done. Um, heart melting and knee shaking, um, kind of an illustration or an allusion to being afraid, uh, being scared, um, because as the city's being overrun, Everybody's going to be terrified. So um, that's what that's an allusion to or, or, uh, or speaking to. Knees smiting together. Um, I, I don't remember being scared when they're striking each other, but I know I've been scared enough where my body's shaking um, because you just don't know what you're going to do. So that's, you know, that's kind of a, a, a thought here. Their situation's hopeless. So, an amazing part of the prophecy here is at the time of, of this, Assyria was it. Um, there was really nobody else. And if you would have looked on paper at what was coming against them on paper, you know, with the Medes and, and um, the Babylonians, there's no way that, um, that they should have lost um, this battle. But yet they, yet they do. Verse 11. Where is the dwelling of lions and the feeding place of young lions where the lions walk, the lioness and the lion's cubs, and no one made them afraid? So Nineveh was a habitation for just bold, strong, and ferocious uh, men. And now we have Nahum here again saying, Where? Um, you know, where are they? Where is it? Um, again, it, to me, it appears a little taunting and ridiculing um, as he's, you know, talking about and, and foreshadowing or foretelling of their fall from power and glory. In the feeding places of the young lions, um, you know, generals would go out, they would defeat communities, um, compute, compete, um, uh, or, or destroy other, other communities, and so they would grab everything back and they would bring it back to their lair, their den, if you will, and there they would consume their success, for lack of terms. Um, wherever they walked, they had no reason to be afraid. Wherever they went, they were victorious. All the nations were afraid of them at the time. So when God's going to destroy Nineveh, is this if he went to the lion's den, found the lion, and killed him in his own home. Um, 
and that's kind of amounts to what he did because he went to the city and that's that's where they were destroyed it wasn't they went out to battle and lost people came to them and just took care of business even though again they thought they were very safe behind uh, their walls verse 12 the lion tore in pieces enough for a cub to kill for his lioness filled his cage with prey and his dens with flesh this speaks to the Assyrians again just being ruthless um, they took no prisoners um, and they were represented as a private alliance um, they worked they worked as a team to to just destroy um, and now she's becoming prey for other nations under the sovereign direction of, of God so they're they're in their houses, their palaces, um, everything um, was full of the riches that they had, that they had plundered, and yet they were never satisfied, having even stripped the um, the wealth of all their neighbors, in, in in really keeping everything for themselves. Verse thirteen: Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke. And the sword shall devour your lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. So the first thing that, that jumped out at me is, says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord. So when I read this, I, I broke down. This should be the most feared words uh, a nation can hear from God. Um, because if God's against you, you're done. And there's a, uh, um, the other side of that, if you will, is, I don't remember in Romans, but there's a verse, if God's for you, you can be against you, so it's the exact opposite. I want to be on that side of the aisle. I don't think I want to be on this side of the aisle. So, um, I'm against you here, used in, uh, in, it's used again in Nehemiah 5. Um, it's devastating, and it, and it also identifies the one who's going to do the scattering, right? So we know that um, um, that it's the Medes and the Babylonians, but actually no, it's not. It's God. It's the Lord of hosts. So he's the one that's actually going to be responsible for um, executing his purposes on the Ninevites. And then verse 5 of, of Nahum says, Behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift the skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdom your shame. Um, basically, he's saying, I'm taking it from you. You're going to have nothing left. And, and it is a shameful thing to have your skirt over your head um, and to be naked. That's just not, you know, not a, it's not a good thing. And that's God's guy. I'm going to take care of you. So it says, burn the chariots, um, devour your lions. Um, the Ninevites were, in the Assyrians were known for um, burning captured cities, and she now received the same, the same fate. The messengers carry edicts from the king; um, they be no more because the city is no more. So, and the, again, the chariots oftentimes are are kind of referring to you know war materials in general, and. God's going to destroy all of that. They're going to burn all of that. And that's going to include their fighting men as well. So they would never be able, again, to pillage or destroy their neighbors and their goods because the Lord destroyed all their weapons of war and destroyed the city. So I was trying to figure out how to, how to wrap this, this up. And done it a couple of day, a couple of different ways and today I scrapped all that and, and did it a different way um, so hopefully it makes a little bit of sense so um, in Jonah and here in, in Nahum we're going to going to see a couple different attributes of, of God um, in the story of Nineveh um, the attributes that we're seeing one gives life one gives death right in Jonah, we see we see God's love and mercy. Um, it's demonstrated by, hey, I'm going to give you mercy. All you got to do is repent. They do. They don't get destroyed. They get to go on for what amounts to about another hundred years. 
And now we're at Nahum, and we're going to see another of God's attributes, and it's 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 His wrath, right? He He's got to judge, um, so He's going to demonstrate justice through wrath and destruction um, as He's judging sin. And it's going to be directed as Nineveh, because over time they have a generation or two have gone from repenting to pretty much being right back where they were, and so God's going to have to take care of that this time. And so it's, 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 it's a book that's giving us insight into what happens when individuals or nations turn away from God. Um, you're, you're setting yourself up for, for judgment. I know I've talked a couple times about the easy button. Um, you know, take the easy button, judge yourself, and maybe God won't. Um, and maybe he'll be kind too, but, you know, was this a kindness? I mean, he had to do it, but I don't know if anybody would say this is more kind than that at all. So in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. God knows what's going on, right? He knows our hearts. Um, you know, and I'm going to kind of talk about becoming a Christian or being saved or whatever. But it's in, in it's not just necessarily that context because you can be a Christian and go astray and, and have to um, have to receive God's chastisement. Um, you know, so there's kind of two paths there, if you will. Um, so maybe ask, you know, what is what is my standing as an individual? Um, what is our standing as a church? What is our standing as a nation um, as it relates to, to God? Um, and then remembering, right, verses uh, Romans 5 eight, God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So knowing God's mercy will not last forever, because God is a just, and because God is just, and as such, he must judge sin and the rejection of the Son. So what are we doing with the Son? Um, and then, uh, how are we restored? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe in God? What, are you, what have you done with his Son? Um, and then until we as individuals can say we're Christians and Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is our God, then we can be of other benefit, right? Because as we are in right standing with God, we can affect our family, we can affect our church, we can affect our nation, we can affect the world, and how it, is, how it behaves. And, you know, Matthew 5, 13 kind of speaks of this saying, you are the salt of the earth, if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it good for anything? Um, but to, is it good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled upon foot? I don't want to be trampled upon by feet. I'd like to make a difference to myself for God, number one, then to my family, then to my friends, then to my church, then, then to our, our country. And then it reminded me how do we help our, our country, right? We pray for its leaders in citizenry, asking individuals to repent and turning to Jesus to trust in him as well. Um, you know, we now find ourselves often looking to government to fix everything. Um, they're put in place by God, so maybe they can fix some things, but can they fix everything? No. Uh, can they fix a messed up heart? No. Can they fix a broken relationship with God? No. Nope. Um, you know, so, you know, you know, I don't need to get into it. You guys know what they can do and what they can't do. So, um, and I think Nineveh was given to us as a, as a sign of part of what happens to a nation, right? Um, that decides it's going to go in a different direction. Matthew 12, 41, it says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in, in the judgment of the generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here, speaking of, of Christ. So Jesus offers mercy and forgiveness of sin by virtue of his death on the cross and in subsequent uh, resurrection. Are we extending his forgiveness through repentance to anyone? 
or are we keeping it to ourselves? If we're keeping it to ourselves, we're not, at the end of the day, we're not doing a whole lot of good there. Because that's not, that's not what our, our, our call is to be, is to get saved and, and, and just keep it to ourselves. So will we uh, ignore the sign of Nineveh and then be judged or we're in part let our, our, our friends, our neighbors, our church, our country uh, be judged because we're letting them go off in the direction of, of Nineveh? Hopefully not. And then the last thing, and I think it kind of uh, sums our, our job up or our position up is Mark 16, 15. And it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So how are we representing Christ in this manner? So, you know, I hope the ending here kind of made some sense because when I, when I went through Nehu, um, it was just, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And when I finished it, I, I was, what was I left with other than all these bad things were going to happen? And I kind of found a pivot point saying, okay, well, that can be uh, kind of a sign or this is what happens if and allow it to be uh, something that we could use to perhaps go in a, a, a different direction. So, um, you know, so pray for, you know, pray for the church that, that we'll, we'll do God's bidding and follow his instruction and his leading only. Families the same way, you know, we want our families to be strong. We want them to, to follow God and have hearts for God. And then our city, you know, our, our state, and it just grows from, from there. Um, but I started at the individual because if you're corrupt, you're not right, you really can't, you know, you really can't help anybody else. Um, so, anyway, so let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this night, for your blessings, Lord. Uh, thank you for the opportunity I got to share. Lord, I, um, I trust that, at least on some levels, that I was on at some point, God, that, um, that words will be um, taken away and, and used in a, a positive manner. God, I, again, I was just reminded, as I was reading in all the, the bad things were happened to, happening to Nineveh, where... You gave them an opportunity, and then they chose to walk away again. And then Israel, you gave them time and time and time again, gave them opportunity, and they walked away. And Lord, on, on a lot of levels, they're walking. They're still um, uh, walking away, you know. And at some point, you'll open their eyes. But um, Lord, we just want to see you, and we want to travel uh, with you and for you, and um, and not be like uh, the, the Nineveh, not as individuals and. Um, surely uh, as a country and uh, take a look around and, and I don't care what side of aisle you're on there's, there's stuff going on and we got this side doesn't like that side that doesn't like this side that doesn't like that side and, and Father you call us to be loving um, to everyone so um, just help us um, we ask this in Jesus name Amen, Amen.